how I like to put it is that the low handicap, the higher skilled golfer, I want him to think and then execute. And the higher handicap, I want it to execute and then think. So that's more or less the language that I emphasize on when I'm designing a more challenging golf course. And if you go all the way to Muni's, usually you have a very strict piece of land. That's where you have your freeway golf, usually, you know, the hole number one, hole number two, hole number three, hole number four, five, six, seven, eight, because of the area that you're usually confronted with. So you're working on a hundred acres maybe, so you gotta fit everything perfectly. A lot of golf courses from the 50s and the 60s are that way as well. So that's something, I mean, in Muni, you, you have to be very creative, which is pretty cool as well, because you have this piece of land, you have all these restrictions, and what are you going to do with them? Hi, this is Tom Tomp from Delphi, Indiana. I enjoy playing golf multiple courses around the Delphi area. This is Golf Harder number 887. Butterfly Golf may be the future of sustainable golf course design with creator Augie Pisa. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Augie. Thank you very much, Fred. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on. I love talking to golf course architects. I, I just, as a, as a recreational golfer, as someone who does not play competitively, um, I like to know what's happening on a golf course. And I love hearing what golf course architects have to say, because they're not generally, they're not the greatest golfers all the time. And so they kind <laughs> of design for us, for the amateurs. Yes. I'm glad you understand that bit. And uh, yes, some <laughs> Some Yes, you're completely right. And not a lot of people know that some of the greatest architects weren't the best players. I mean, you can start right off with Alistair McKenzie. He was just a great, you know, just uh, a great student of the game uh, and, uh, and of golf architecture, of course. Amazing. And, have, you know, you ha I know that you have a master's in golf course architecture. I've been reading on your bio. Um, what does that entail? I'm fascinated by that. To go to school to learn golf course architecture, is that history? Is that agronomic? What elements are you, are you studying? That, that's a very good question. And I love that because, yes, I was surprised as well a few years ago when I learned that this, you know, a master's degree specifically in golf course architecture exists or existed. And obviously, it had to be in the cradle of golf, Scotland, yeah, mm -hmm. Edinburgh University, and, uh, and this was in 2001, 2002, when I started, you know, to look for what was next for me. Um, I'm, I'm an architect by trade. I'm a vertical licensed architect by trade. And, uh, uh, but I, I was, I was <clears throat> in construction. Uh, my first six years, seven years were dealing with construction, project management, et cetera. So that, that was an advantage for me because I know the bones, the backbones and all the, you know, the uh, uh, everything that, that goes underneath the skin of, of, of golf. So going back to your question is I'm, I'm looking at, you know, 2001 looking for either diploma courses, master's degree, what else is out there? Because I knew that, I mean, at that time anyway, celebrity golf uh, designers were at its peak, you know, uh, uh, 80s, all 90s and uh, beginning of 2000s. Celebrity golf designers were at their peak. So it was like, hey, I'm not going to win a major anytime soon. I'm not going to get a green jacket unless I go buy it in uh, somewhere. I'm not going to get a nice green jacket like that. Uh, you know, so what am, I need to go study. I need to go follow the footsteps of the, the uh, you know, the, the, the uh, students of the game. So – I found this master's degree. I was like, holy moly, I have to do this. I applied. At the end, we didn't know, but I, I, I think there was like 110 applicants. 11 of us from different parts of the world got in. It was part of the EIGCA, European Institute of Golf Course Architects, um, which is the equivalent of the American Society of Golf Course Architects. And um, uh, yeah. It was just an amazing experience. I was very lucky to get in. I sold my everything, my toaster, everything. And I'm like, let's go to that sunny Scottish weather 
uh, great <laughs> accent that I'm going to understand and, uh, and, and, and just have fun doing my master's degree. So that's what I did. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Tijuana. I grew up in Tijuana and, oh. uh, uh, by your expression, yes, regular people grow up in Tijuana too, Fred. So, no, no, I understand that. No, I, no, I have no problem with Tijuana. No, no, I just, no, just don't kidding. know. The, I don't know how I, much golf exists in I, Tijuana. I know that you are an adventurer, and uh, and you've been to the Baja, and you've been to a lot of places in the world. So uh, I admire that about you, which is great. That adventure side, I love it as well. Uh, so my point is that yes, you know, being a, growing up in Tijuana, I did not grow up as a as a golfer. But I did grow up in the Tijuana Country Club. And you will be surprised, Fred, what I'm going to tell you that Tijuana Country Club, when it first started in the 1930s, early, late 20s, early 30s of last century, it was the biggest, uh, it was called Agua Caliente uh, Golf Club. And it had the biggest purse of the PGA Tour back then. I mean, Saracen was playing here. Bobby Jones was playing here. Ben Hogan played here. And it was the biggest, the largest purse at that time. Vegas did not exist. There was, <laughs> uh, there was the uh, pro Prohibition era. So we had in Tijuana the casinos, the, uh, the country club, the uh, Caesar salad. That was the, year, the, the, the era where Caesar salad was invented in Tijuana. So we were living at large in TJ. And then, uh, and then the country club became, or it, the Agua Caliente eventually became the country club that we now know as the Tijuana Country Club. So there is a very good history. Uh, it's a Billy Bell design. And if you go back, I mean, that, that's part of the, of our Cali, Baja Cali, golden age of golf architecture from San Francisco down to Tijuana, that's part uh, of that generation of golf courses. So it's, it, it's very rich in, in, in history. You'll be surprised. That's what I was going to tell you. Oh, I am shocked. And so, <laughs> I, I bet, but wait a minute. I got to back up here. Caesar salad was invented in Tijuana? Si, senor. Yes, sir. Come on. Really? Caesar salad was invented in Tijuana. That's in hilarious. The early, in the early 30s at the restaurant called, was called Caesar's or Caesar's Hotel was the place where it was invented uh, uh, years ago, where you had all these celebrities coming down to have fun in Tijuana because they couldn't do it elsewhere in uh, California or in the States. Amazing. So, uh, so Tijuana from this side, I mean, you could, uh, Cuba on the other side was also uh, living, living at large as well on the other side before. Oh, yeah. We know happened, happened in the, uh, uh, in the 50s, but... And growing up, you know, in Prohibition era, Tijuana was a fantastic point of entertainment and leisure. And I'll stop there of, uh, of, <laughs> of, of a lot of celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> You'll stop at the leisure part. <laughs> I'll tell you my favorite part of Tijuana and one of the most memorable for me in the times that I've been there, High Life. Oh, Highlight. That's High that building. Is How's that building? How's the architecture amazing. of that building? Uh, Gorgeous. Frank? Okay, so that we had that casino to match, the Hialai, Caesars Hotel, the casino that matched. I mean, uh, we had the racetrack where um, uh, there's a Disney movie, I think, that, that that's based here, in, that, that uh, it's raced. One of the races is in Tijuana. So we, we, we have that rich history in golf which unfortunately we do not embrace. Mm -hmm. uh, and me growing up, going back to your question, my brother and I growing up in Tijuana at the country club, we played every sport except for golf. And, but it was right there. And, yeah. uh, and that's how I grew up. Uh, I played every sport. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan and, and I grew up in sports. My family, uh, you know, comes from PE teaching and, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so so we grew up in in sports all of our life. From my grandfather, this is another funny story uh, or, or or a cool story for me. My my great uncle was the uh, the stuntman for the black and white uh, uh, Weissmuller's Tarzan. 
Uh, he was the first Mexican to swim across the English Channel in 1953, swimming, of course. He did it twice because the first time his friends didn't believe him. He thought it was a fluke. <laughs> they, they gave him a hard time. That that's a fluke. And so he did it twice. Wow. And then he became, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a type of celebrity. And, uh, and, uh, and it, so we come from that beside, side of, of, of sports culture in our family. When I grow up, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I'm inventive. I don't know. I'm, I'm a destroyer at the house, you know, <laughs> making up stuff. And, and uh, so I, I knew that I wanted to become an architect since I was 11 years old in fifth grade elementary, more or less. Hmm. Uh, I knew without hesitation that I wanted to become an architect. And, and when, I, when I studied architecture, uh, I, now it was like, how do I mix sports with architecture? That was my first thought. I mean, I, I need to mix my, my two passions, sports and architecture. Okay, maybe I'll do stadiums. I'm a diehard Charger fan living in, in, in Tijuana where Padres and Chargers. Don't look at me that way. That's just, that's just, no, I'm just saying I'm sorry the, they left. That's the lottery. <laughs> yeah, yes, <right>. that's, <laughs> Chargers left. Now they're in LA. Chargers left. But I'm still, I'm still a Charger fan, even though, I mean, they're only an hour and a half away from me. Right. So, so anyway, we, we – that's when I started to think, okay, maybe I can do stadiums. Maybe I can do, you know, whatever, country clubs, parks. I had no idea until I graduated. And I played a little when I was, when I was younger, just out in the country club. But I wanted contact sports. I wanted to get dirty. I, I played football all my life. <laughs> I played tennis. I played everything, basketball, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I, uh, when I graduated, I couldn't play all these sports anymore. Uh, because there's no leagues, they just you stop playing, no. And uh, so I decided to get back to golf. I said, now it's the time for golf. Yeah. And now I go back. I'm 23, 24, 24 years old. I, I uh, dusting off my golf clubs. I'm, I'm still a, a member because you can be a member till you're 28 if you're not married. So I went and practiced every day. So uh, at that time. I had a conversation, an enlightened conversation with a dear friend of mine who got me into golf course architecture. And, uh, and that's the time that, you know, I got enlightened and, uh, and he was nice enough to uh, introduce me to Paragon, uh, Jack Nicholas construction company. They were creating golf courses in Mexico in Palmilla and El Dorado down in Cabo. And that was my first gig, and uh, and the rest is history. Now, here we are chatting away, Fred. Amazing. Well, I was able, like you, I was able to take my two passions um, of audio production, you know, came from radio and golf, and created this podcast. Now I'm in my 18th year of doing it. So I Fantastic. totally get it. Thank you, and and I and thank you very much for inviting me to your podcast because I oh. love the name, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, let's take a time out. Uh, I promise we will talk about golf course architecture, but I have a feeling that Augie and I are going to be going all over the place on this one, but we're going to take a time out and we'll figure it out. We'll be right back. Unfortunately, the last time I was in Tijuana, was I think it was 2015. My wife and I had gone down to Cabo for a week of relaxation and didn't realize that the rain that they had said was coming was actually a hurricane. And we were, oh. yeah, we were in hurricane Odile. Oh, a nice one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a, that was a good one. And, um, yep. we had only, we'd only been in town for like 24 hours and they, and we were going out to lunch. Um, and they said, okay, where are you going? I'm like, I beg your pardon. Like, yeah, where are you going right now? I said, well, we're, we have lunch reservations. We're going out. They said, be back by two o'clock. It's like, why do you want us back by two o'clock? It's like, because that's when the hurricanes can hit. You're going to be what? in the shelter. You have to be in the shelter. Yeah. We had, we had, and we had to move our room. We had an ocean view room. They, they moved us back to the back of the building. Um, and it was horrendous. It was horrifying. It was horrifying. Oh yeah. And we were there, uh, after it happened, we were there 
we were stuck. No water, no power yep. for three days. And finally, we were airlifted out. And they, they said, they didn't check passports. They didn't look at your luggage, nothing. They yeah, said, course. you want to go to Cancun, Tijuana, or yeah. Guadalajara? And we're like, uh, Tijuana. They went, okay, go get on that plane. And luckily, we got on the plane. They dropped us off in Tijuana. We had to walk across the border. And then my son drove down from L.A. and uh, picked us up. Actually, we took a bus to the border. They dropped us off there. Then they, he picked us up in San Diego. Nope, that was the bus from Tijuana when we crossed the border into San Diego. And then he, 2 o'clock in the morning, he picked us up in San Diego okay. and drove us back to L.A. Hurricanes in Cabo are no joke. No, because they don't. That was like no the first joke. time in 40-plus years that it had happened. Yes, and now it's happening like every five years. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. And in Cabo, if you know, uh, I don't, I don't know if everybody that's that's listening or, or or viewing this, but Cabo is in the tip of the peninsula of whole California, and then Baja California, right. and it's southern right tip. tip. And hurricanes, southern tip, and hurricanes that which start down in Central America and come up through Acapulco, Puerto Vallarta, Mazatlan start opening up right. right right towards Cabo. It's right in the in the middle of the highway of Hurricane Highway yeah. 101. That's Cabo. So it, it it is it is tough. Whenever you see a, a hurricane, usually for travelers out there, I mean hurricane season is gonna begin in the, the real hurricane season, September, mm -hmm. October. Yep. Watch out! That's where we were. Two months. Just, that was, just be aware. The good thing is that you have like five days of of uh, of, of of head start, heads up. Yeah, where you can change your flight or do. Whatever. We thought it was just so going to be you rain. Should've, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, Oops. You should have stopped in Tijuana and had the Caesar salad. <laughs> it was the middle of the night, um, and you also mentioned <laughs> the palmilla down in uh, Cabo. Yes. I have played. I was there. doing Palmilla. That was that was a beautiful. It did is. You, a beautiful did you did you design My that course? My sentimental favorite. No, I did not. That's the Jack Nicholas signature. Yeah, that's what I but I was working for his uh, construction company. Okay. So I was. That was my first gig. Fred was make sure that all of the labor guys had cold water in their jugs. That was my first gig. <laughs> uh, so that was my job, just to run around the site, putting ice and putting water. In the uh, in the five gallon jugs or whatever. No. So, and then from there I started working my way up, and uh, is it until I project managed the job eventually? And yeah, it was. Is it three nines? Isn't that? It's three nines. Yeah, that's I what was I involved thought. in the. I was involved in the ocean nine, the last one, okay. the ocean nine, and then and then because of another hurricane, I I I, I forget it was in EC's. No, I forget the other hurricane. It was in two thousand in uh, in ninety. 99 or 98 ish mm -hmm. 99 uh we went back to the other nines to revamp it because there was another hurricane yeah. coming in that year uh so so that was my first gig and, and then i had participated as well in el dorado and overall i've been very lucky i've, I've been involved in five golf courses uh in in cabo uh during my career oh, nice. so i love that place yeah. it's a very special place for me yeah. and it's our mecca of golf it's right. the mecca of golf on our side of the world in uh in latin america well the time that i played there i played the front nine then i said oh i'm just gonna go grab a sandwich they said you know what uh here's what we want you to do there's a threesome just going teeing off on the the second nine over there just go join them we'll bring you the sandwich i'm like great no problem and one of the three people that they hooked me up with there was Jesse the Body Ventura. No. <laughs> Where, and Roddy Roddy Piper. It was Roddy, he, Roddy no. Piper and and so <laughs> Jesse Ventura, he had already been the, the governor of, of Minnesota. And he was okay. wearing a tank top. He had a beard. His beard was braided down to, you know, had a little braid <laughs> sticking down. He had a, a huge, around his neck was a huge pewter marijuana leaf. I'll say it. I mean, he's, it's, it was a long time ago. And I'm like, what it's legal. Now. Yeah, right. It's legal yeah. Now, I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And he says, well, actually I live down here now because my wife, uh, she agreed. I, there were two things that I wanted and she only agreed to one, which was I wanted to run for president and I <laughs> wanted to be, um, 
I wanted to live in Mexico. And she says, if you don't run for president, I'll move to Mexico. So, and, Love it. and he talked, <laughs> not, he was so much fun. He told stories nonstop, whether you were hitting, putting, it didn't matter. He was still talking. He had this little stogie of a guitar, that, a guitar of a cigar that he was chewing on that was just dripping down the side of his face. Totally entertaining. Well, totally entertaining. I remember the, the, the lucky, uh, I mean, I don't know how his uh, political career was, but he had, I remember him from his WWF. Yeah, show, exactly. Because uh, I was growing up, I was growing up, I was, I don't know, I was probably like 15, 14 years old at that oh. time. So well. me and my little brother were always watching WWF. Yeah, well, <laughs> when we get off this call, I'll tell you my stories about working with the WWF and hanging out with okay. Randy Macho Man Savage. It's, oh. it's a crazy story and one of my all time favorites. Let's talk about golf course architecture for okay, a minute. Let's talk about Do we golf. have to? Sure, we do. <laughs> Um, uh, where do we begin? So, okay. From a, from a designer's point of view, speaking as a amateur golfer, what's the difference for you in design between a country club, a resort course and a Muni? Oh, there's a, there should be difference. And that is one of the most important things, Fred. And the first thing that we do when we arrive with a new client, with the new, uh, uh, either if it's if it's remodel or new, it's what is the why? Why are we here? Why is everybody here? What is the purpose? Uh, the purpose of the of of what we're doing here. I mean, from master planning to to okay, we're going to master plan, and then what's it going to be? Is it going to be a pay and play? Is it going to be a country club, private, semi private? Is it a resort course? Everything, if you know what you're talking about, every single category should be designed different. Hmm. Maybe a, a, a resort course, you would like, you're thinking about people that are there once a year, maybe for a week. They just want to break a hundred, Fred. That's what they're there for. I just want to break a hundred. I'm going to open a champagne. I'm going to open a nice bottle of wine. I'm going to have a nice dinner with my wife after I break a hundred on this course. That's what they're looking for. That's in an overall, uh, you know, perspective. Yes. So if you're in a country club, is it private? What is the average of your membership? Is the average of your membership 60 years old? Then it's a different golf course. You can't create a bunker where it's easy to come in and then it's not easy to come out, you know, because you're, they're going to need a rope or they're going to need some <laughs> steps. So all of that, and, and it's, I know it's, it's, it's funny, but not funny. It's kind of like you, you see all these golf courses where we come in and, and, and reassess or remodel. And it's like, guys, what's, what's the membership uh, average here? You know, all of these bunkers, they look beautiful, but you need access. You need access, not on the way in. The way in is easy. The way out. Mm. So all of these. The, when you say the maybe, average, you maybe, meant the average age, not the average scores. The average age, yeah. not the average, not the average handicap yeah. or the average score. Yeah. No, <laughs> the average age. So all of these things you take into account. But the number one thing is, what's the purpose? What is the why? What are why are we in this room right now? What is the purpose? And what is the business plan? Does it match? How can we now after we have those now? Our experience, our studies, our, you know, criteria, everything now blends in and now we can help you. Okay. But if you do not have, and sometimes we collaborate and cooperate as in, we think that this golf course should do this. Yes, we do it as well. But the more information that you have, the more professional minds, the better the think tank, the better the focus group the better the result. So what is what do you have in mind, Fred? That is the very important thing and we insist in our to our clients cuz you know we we're, we're not we don't want to just we're not there to take the money. We're there to help. We're there to actually analyze this. Yes, I I'm uh, you know how can we cure your golf course with maybe some makeup, maybe some botox and where it needs maybe we'll do surgery. But I would like to, in a remodel, that's my, our approach, uh, is that maybe some holes will need a little bit of makeup, some holes will need a little bit of Botox, and some surgery. 
if it doesn't need surgery, uh, then it doesn't need it. But you will only know if you know the purpose of the golf course in 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 two years. Where do they visualize yourself in two years, or in ten, or in twenty? So yes, everything makes a difference, or it should anyway. If you know what you're talking about, if you know what you're doing, Fred, every single objective will make us design the golf course differently. Fascinating. I'm going to take another time out and have more questions about getting from the client, your client, to the consumer. And we'll be back right after this. Okay, so I understand, I completely understand as being a, a vendor, when I meet with a new client, it's like, who's your target audience when I'm creating new content for them? Who are you talking to? What are you talking to? But from the golfer's perspective, from the amateur, from the traveling golfer, from the local golfer, what can I take into consideration knowing, okay, this course was designed as a as a country club, meaning I'm going to be playing here a lot. Or like you said, with a resort course, I'm going to play here once a year. Maybe I'll play here just once. And then there's the munis who are, you know, they're not dedicated to their, their golf or they, you know, like in Los Angeles, you have to be, belong to a country club because there's not a lot of public golf courses there, which is very frustrating. Or you have to drive an hour plus mm -hmm. to get to golf courses. So as the consumer, as the golf consumer and the recreational golfer, what is it that I should understand about golf course architecture that is different between those three presentations? Oh, that's another good one, Fred, because I, I, the first things, first things first, and it, and it's, I, I like how that you mention it because when we get with our client, we usually, we, he's not our end. He's not our end user. Right. Yes. So when it, when we're with our client, he we, just wants his I, name usually, on it. He just exactly. he just wants to see his name in big letters. And, but but sometimes the golf design or the master plan, we even have to save it from his opinion because he is not the end user. So you have to understand again what's the brief. What is the, the business plan? Where, 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 why are we doing this? What's the why? So I, I always kid around, kidding, not kidding. It's like, hey, you know, Mr. X, you are not our client. You are the person that writes the checks. Yes. And thank you very much. <laughs> but our clients, our clients, you and I, is the end Correct. user. We want the end user to be coming out of this golf experience with a big smile on their face. That's what we want. And and if and and we're we're very we love to give to make business for our clients. That's the whole purpose. So it's not for us the ego has to stay outside the room when we're designing this for the purpose that uh, that we want, which is, you know, the uh, making a sustainable golf course in the economic side. In the, in, in the ecologic side and the social aspect. So that is the first thing. So our end users and how, as an end user, what, you, what can you expect? This is another tricky one, uh, Fred, because not all golf courses are created equal. Mm -hmm. Not all golf courses are, have the maintenance budget. Not all golf courses have the same ticket, the same experience, the same everything, which is part of the beauty of golf. Every golf course is different. So, get you know, starting from there, I, I, I think number one, it's it's bear in mind where you're at. You know, if you're in a fifteen dollar muni, let's not over, let's not exaggerate here. It's not going to be U.S. Open conditions. Uh, let's 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 so let, let's first know where we're at. Yes, uh, so. And again, if you're in a, if you're in Pebble Beach, if you're in Torrey Pines, if you're in Aviada here in San Diego, you're gonna expect you know every little flower to be blooming and it's beautiful and everything. So, uh, I, I mean, very ample thing to talk about, Fred. But I would, you know, there, there, uh, I wouldn't really think a lot 
uh, unless you know it is a, a very good designer and very well maintained, I think that you can actually start appreciating this, appreciating the architecture. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's very difficult to explain, to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. uh, because expectations are, are, are hard. You know, it's a, that's the first point. Probably I would, my first tip would be don't expect anything and then try and read the golf course. Uh, but again, it depends on where you're at. So it's, it's very difficult. Okay. Let me, let me get into specifics then, because I really want to pursue this thought. Fair designing fairways. Country clubs, resorts, munis. What's the difference in the design of fairways for those three types of courses? Okay. For resort, you're going to want an, a, 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 a wide landing area. Yeah, so usually a resort, it can go all the way to 300 feet of landing area. I mean, it's crazy. You can just spray it all over the place. And, uh, but that's the whole point. You Remember, this we, guy want, to break 100. We, want, we want this guy to break right. 100. So let's give him this area and then let's give him the nice rolling greens. Maybe there's some movement, but it's not going to have, you know, from, from 20 feet or 30 feet, you're not going to really move the ball a lot. Maybe it's 1% falling left to right, but it's not going to wiggle itself a lot. So those are, are, are a few things, obviously bunker yeah, well, position. Let's stay with cetera. fairways. I'll get to bunkers in a minute. <laughs> let's say okay. fairways. So let's stay with the fairways. Let's do it. You're going to do it ample. On a country club, private, semi-private, you're going to go a little bit of a more of a potential player's course because you do want your to challenge your membership. And, and yes, but again, what is the overall, uh, you know, uh, average age of your membership and in 50 years it's going to change so if the if if the country club did not create a good job of getting new membership then then the golf course is going to be old as in as in bunker position as in everything and again the example of the bunkers that you can go in but then you can't come out Etc. So you also have to be very careful careful about that. Right. So in in, um, in a country uh, club, uh, people are playing there multiple times a week. So you want it to be a little more yes. challenging. That's where you want to create a little. If if I'm designing a country club, I am thinking about mystere. I'm thinking about about creating little nuisances mm. that uh, that that you're not that you're going to discover eventually. I'm <laughs> I'm really thinking about a, 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 a completely different state of mind in design. I want you uh, 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 I want you to really start discovering like a great painting, a great piece of art, great work of art that every time you see it, you discover nice. something. Depend it, it doesn't matter of your of your handicap, your ability to play. I usually how I like to put it is that the low handicap, the the, the highly higher skilled golfer, I want him to think and then execute. And uh, the higher handicap, I want it to execute and then mm -hmm. think. And then it's kind of like, oh, wait a minute, I could have done that. Yes. So, so that's that's what that's more or less the language that I that I that I emphasize on when I when I'm designing a a more challenging golf course. Now I do it anyway on a resort, but but uh, but that's just an example. And if you go all the way to Muni's, I, I mean, usually you just I, I, unless it's a super Muni, usually you have a very, very, you know, strict piece of land that where you, where, where you can't maybe do a lot of dog legs. So that's where you have your freeway golf. Usually, you know, the hole number one, hole number two, hole number three, hole number four, five, six, seven, eight, because of the, uh, of, of the, of the, the area patch of that land you're that usually, you're working on, uh, yeah. confronted with. Exactly. So you're working on a hundred acres maybe. So you got to fit everything, uh, perfectly, uh, and that's and that's those that's the model of the old country clubs. But then you would have to go back to history, and then uh, you know after after the Great Depression and uh, and then the economic boom comes up uh, late uh, early fifties, and that's that's where everybody wanted a golf course. So you had you, you wanted to produce a quick golf course, and that, a lot of golf courses from the fifties and the sixties are mm -hmm. that way as well. So. Uh, 
uh, that's that's something. I mean, in Muni, you you have to you, you have to be very creative, which which is pretty cool as well, because you have this piece of land, you have all these restrictions, and what are you going to do with them? So uh, I think all going back to the beginning of of, of of this chat, Fred, it's like what are you going to do again? What's the brief? What can we do? Uh, in, in California, you're going to have less acres of grass than in other places. Um, all these challenges you need to really uh, take into account. Now, uh, how we like to design is that we like to take if you if you look at this 2D. Let's look at the 2D first. You're in a in a in a in a in a sheet of paper with all this topography and all these uh, you know constraints or or advantages or whatever the SWOT analysis uh, you come up with, and then I like to see it as first it's an experience of creating a treasure mm-hmm. map. Let's create this treasure map. You have this beautiful piece of land because all pieces of land could be beautiful if you look at it that way. So what are we going to enhance? What are we going to create? We want to create this as an adventure, as a treasure map. We want to take the golfer exploring, come back to that corner, come back to this level, go up to that level, see this rock, see this tree, see the ocean, see the mountains, see the desert. All of this, you want to create a treasure map in the rooting. The rooting is one of the most important things that you're going to get. Not everybody's a good rooter, but the rooting is number one. It's part of the secret. How is the orientation? How is, 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 is the elevation, et cetera, and what points are you exploring? So you take the golfer out exploring. Now, Fred, as we like to see it, the third dimension is what I, I like to call the, uh, you know, that's when you create the, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the third dimension is giving it the body. Yes. So it's, you have the, the emotional graph. What am I going to do with you on this 3D graph now? And it's how I like to see it is like creating a great play a great theatrical play, an artistic movie, an an 18-hole chapter book, where you're going to start with the rising action, the plot, the rising action, the climax, the surprising ending, or the how all of that structure is how I design a golf course. And I'm thinking of these holes where maybe I'm going to be a little bit easy on you on hole number one, two, and three, and then I'm going to pick it up a a little bit, and then we're going to arrive to eight and nine or seven and eight, then I'm going to let you rest. I'm going to pick. You're going to pick up a couple of uh, uh, of bogeys that you left out there with maybe a birdie. But then I'm going to take it away on this. So, so I'm thinking about this story, and and again, and and, and you saw it on the uh, on the, where I broke down the uh, the Tobacco Road. That was like hole number one on Tobacco Road. Was like boom, <laughs> right in your face. Let me. Uh, I, I mean, so so. Would you like to see that murder scene on the front? Right when you uh, when you're sitting down to watch a movie, boom, murder scene is 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 gone. You're there. You're like shocked. That's the beauty of Tobacco Road. I personally would love it if we start on the back nine, as I said, because it starts a little bit, you know, dog leggy, and then you start getting up to to thirteen, uh, where now you see the Tobacco Road ish. Uh, you know, plot coming and you're like, holy moly. So, uh, but I love, I love what Mike Strantz did with the, you know, I love it as well. It's just, it's just, how are you designing this movie? How are you writing this book, Fred? That is the whole secret of great artistic golf course architecture. Wow. Um, uh, okay. Another time out. I'll, I, I'll, we'll be right back. You said so much. I don't even know where to go um, on this. It, it, that um, I love that you said nuisance. I love that you said nuisance and not nuance. That when you're designing for golf courses, ah. um, that you, you create nuisance for for a golfer for their eye for what they're approaching. Um, that they yes. may not discover yes. until they've played that course a couple of times. They just thought it was a hard hole, yes. but now, oh, exactly. he put that nuisance there. And that becomes the nuance. Yeah. I just love that. 
I think that's so great. <laughs> so when you're designing, you. using your movie analogy here, are you designing in two or three acts? Is it nine holes, nine holes and nine holes, or is <laughs> it six holes, six holes, six uh, holes? It could be. Usually, usually what we do is uh, think about the, uh, the six holes, six holes, and six holes. As a matter of fact, one of my new concepts is the butterfly golf, which is four loops of six. But right, you know, we can we can we can uh, get that uh, to that later. But uh, usually, it's a six, and it's not only a six. It's, it doesn't mean that it's from hole one to hole six. It just means that six holes are going to be challenging. Six holes are uh. going to be medium, or or or, uh, and then six there could be a. Uh, 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 you know, uh, challenge, challenge. Uh, <sighs> take a breath. Okay. Relax, you know, kind of like just, you just have to hit this ball and, and you'll be fine. You'll, you'll, you'll have an easy bogey or, or an easy par depending or, or, or an easy birdie depending on your ability and, uh, and get, get some, get some strokes back. But that is all of this adventure with the emotional graph that we – and we actually have an emotional graph. I mean I actually draw it from what I think the message is when you're, when you're playing the golf course. So all of this comes into, into effect. Now, if you want to get technical, now we're talking about sustainability, the, 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 the balance between science and, and, and art – in 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 relationship to nature uh we're talking about shot values you know we're talking about am i giving you we have like a list of 50 shots that i like to it's it's kind of like a 50 shot exam that we also have when we're designing so uh have i have i am i asking you for this shot for that shot for this shot have i you know do you have a a a a, a fade lie to a to uh to a draw green have i asked you for that so but that now those are the nuances now it's like okay now i'm gonna start asking you but again what is the brief is this a player's course is this a more challenging or is this a resort style golf course i'm not gonna i'm not gonna put the ball underneath your feet a lot if you land on the fairway yes so it's different it's different askings for a different type of of audience. Now, one thing that I love, Fred, and I like to say this as well, is that I love that our golf courses or that, that golf, which is a beauty in, in, in architecture is, I, I love how it changes with your sense of humor. <laughs> you play, you, you, you play well, I'm the best architect in the world. You play bad, I'm horrendous yeah. at architecture. But that's the beauty. I want, I, I'm, and I learned this it's, since we were in, since I studied regular architecture. The cathedrals in the Middle Ages were done to make you feel mm. minuscule mm. as a human being. Yeah. Yes. So all of that, I mean, it had basically two points. One was that the Ojival uh, Gothic architecture could reach the sky, yes? But the other one was working with the scale, with the human scale, to make you feel like this. So that all of that psyche behind the architecture, behind the proportion, behind the rhythm, behind the balance, that is very important. I take that to Beautiful. golf architecture. Beautiful. Um, uh, wow. So much to discuss with you. You're, you're definitely coming back. I just want you to know you're definitely coming back because there's so much to discuss. <laughs> Thank you. Looking but for, we're not done. <laughs> we're going to keep going here. Um, what has there ever been conversation? Has there ever been a discussion among golf course architects and even golf course um, developers on creating courses? Because you know people's time is valuable, and a lot of complaints about golf taking too much of your day, taking too long to play. So right now we're in a world of 18 holes where you play nine holes or you play 18 holes, you know, like, and you know, if you're, if you're in a country club, it's like, I'm going to play three holes today. That's okay. But for, for most of us, it's like, I'm going to play nine today. No, I'm going to play an 18 hole course. What about the idea? And I know maybe design wise, it's too difficult um, because the topography or even clubhouse design of 
I want to play six holes today. I'm going to play 12 holes today. I'm going to play 18. So instead of a two hour or a four hour round or a two and a half and a five hour round, we're talking about, I'm going for an hour and a half today. I'm going to go for three hours. I'm going to go for the. Uh, unless you're a member of a country club, right. that doesn't happen or seldom does it happen. Now, now these golf courses are starting really? to pop up, which is great. Uh, but you, you have to, yeah, but not, not, not that, not common. <laughs> They're starting to pop up, but you have to go back to history. I mean, 500 years ago, 300 years ago, golf was played in yeah. any hole there is. I mean, the, the, the first, the first opens in, 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 in the British Isles were played in Prestwick mm. with 12 holes. St. Andrews, as, as you probably saw in the video, St. Andrews was 22 holes. So, I, I mean, what just, you know, the, the 18 became the, the norm and then became the rule okay. and then now it's championship and it evolved to that, which is fair enough. But then you're right. The best, the commodity that the high, the, the art, our time is very valuable, and we have known that, especially all this pandemic uh, 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 part. I think we all learned that how to appreciate and how we can manage our time and our priorities. So, yes, you're right. Uh, uh, you know, the problem is that when you're in the golf course, I don't care. You, you can wait for twilight, and they still <laughs> charge you for an 18-hole yeah. twilight. Why don't you charge me six? Why don't you charge me, you know, uh, you know, Three bucks a hole, five bucks a hole. I don't know, but let's get into other types of operations, other types of, you know, I, it, it would be great if I can just, if it's 4.30 and I'm like, I'm, I'm done here with Fred. I'm going to go play six holes. Hopefully that could happen, but no, I have to pay the full on uh, the full price of, of Twilight for an 18 hole. So uh, that's, that's another story mm. that, you know, it's an operations of, I, that I would love for it to change. You can charge by hole, et cetera, on certain days. I have no idea because it's not my department. But I, what, I, what is my part, my, my, my part of this uh, solution, Fred, uh, is that it, we have created since 2017, we have been designing for the non-golfer. I, uh, I don't know how, how, how aware you are about that, but uh, we started to create Wellness Golf We've designed a few concepts, and that is why. And we've been very lucky in the past years to be, uh, you know, mentioned as as some or top five or top ten or whatever of uh, innovative architecture visionaries, uh, etc. On top of the sustainability, because you can also argue the sustainability. But what did we do? What did we do? And what we were thinking? And in our design studio in 2017 is, hey, you know, golf is time consuming. Golf is <laughs> judgmental golf is intimidating uh pricey uh etc etc cetera, et cetera. and uh, it takes a long large piece of land so developers can only create a huge piece of land or not so there's a, a, a higher risk we started to to for the non-golfer which is you know all of these factors let's get the grandmother to play with the grandson let's get the the, the mother to play with the daughter. Let's get all of these that you don't see in a country club. So we started to design Wellness Golf, which I uh, would love for you guys to say. If you hashtag Wellness Golf, uh, a lot of things will come up or in our in our Instagram. So Wellness Golf, Multipurpose Golf, Golf Lounge, The Pit, all of these we started to design. And then, and, and funny that you mention it, because then the other concept that we created, you're going to love this one. I don't know if you can see it there, mm -hmm. but it says butterfly golf. And this is butterfly golf. Four loops oh. of six. So how many loops do you need for an 18-hole golf course? Three. So that means that if you create four loops of six and you're only using three, you can play different golf course every day. And since... Since, whole no since there are four hole number ones, I don't know if I'm explaining myself, but you, if, these are not combinations. They're actually permutations because you don't care where number one starts as long as it starts one, 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 one. So you play this one, 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 and then this one, this one, this one, this, la, 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 24 different golf courses 
with six more holes. So we we actually think, and we're very positive, we're actually working on a couple of golf courses now that have the butterfly uh, golf concept. It, it was, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it invented, created, and designed by, by Pisa Golf. And we love and we feel very proud to, to, to create these concepts, never before seen. And um, so with these four loops of nine, now you can go and play six holes, Fred. You can play nine, you can play 12, you can play 24, you can play 18. And if you're there for 24 days, I will promise you those 24 days, you will play a different circuit. That's an incredible concept. And I, I promise the Golf Smarter listeners, the audio listeners, I'll create a short video on just what he explained because he was holding up a diagram <laughs> that, that explains what the, the butterfly golf is. So keep looking in social media for the short video that I'll put out. On, I'll put it in YouTube and LinkedIn and, and Instagram, TikTok. I'll put it all over the place so you can see exactly what Augie was, was just talking about. That was brilliant. I love that Concept. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate You've mentioned it. multiple times uh, sustainable you, courses. Now, yes, that was probably not a word used in original golf course design. It's probably more of a 21st century concept. What exactly do you mean by sustainable golf course, and why? And I, I apologize for asking two questions at once, but why is it important? It is important because we we need to create a conscience. Uh, I mean, you know, to go, golf courses weren't even altered. I mean, you used the links. You had you had the sheep, you know, grazing grazing the grass. You had the fertilizers from the birds. You had uh, you you had sandy soil. We're talking about the British links, yes. Uh, you had sandy soil. Now, industrial revolution comes up. You know, late eighteen hundreds industrial revolution. Guess what? Now we can create the first golf course in in uh, clay so let instead of traveling for 12 hours on train to play the scottish links now we can have our first golf course here in london so the men uh, you know human beings ego now it's like hey let's bring it over here so now we alter the 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 sequence of nature now we can build whatever we want because we discovered or made machines and that, curiously, that's when golf, proper golf architecture began, because prior to that, it was nature and it was actually just laying out a golf course. When that golf, when that industrial revolution comes up, the hairy colts of the world started to make plans because you needed to plan to build it on clay and create these movements that only nature could do. So to emulate nature, you had to plan. And that's when the first, you know, paper plans mm -hmm. began when we took these golf courses away from natural links. So uh, there's a big debate, at least in my book. I mean, I, I create my <laughs> own debates. I mean, so <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, for me is, did we do the right thing of forcing golf on other parts of the world? I mean, should... Lake Las Vegas ever existed should should you know or should have we played like tennis in clay and in different types of of surfaces instead because the the you know the 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 game the rules the 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 honorable games could stay the same regardless of where you're playing doesn't matter so anyway that is something that we took as human beings because we could and we took it all over the world. And it was beautiful, it was great, and, and we're all passionate about this sport. So now, forward, years, years later, and we have, you know, I mean, golf contributes a lot. To be honest, Fred, golf contributes a lot. There is, there is I mean, in, just, in, just in, in, if you take it into account, the, um, it, it's the sport that, that creates or generates most employment mm. of any other sport when it comes to maintenance the maintenance crew the operations crew there's you know there's a lot of uh, dozens of, of of people working there so you asked me about sustainability the more that we advance the more people that were here the more 
blah, 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 all of that, you have to create a better conscience. We have to eat less meat because deforestation is one of the highest, you know, of the most important things in, in, in what we're in, in our, in our, uh, in our world. We're deforestation because of the meat industry. We, we have all this methane coming up. We have a lot of things. So meat lovers, you know, if we don't measure ourselves, it, it's only going to become a bigger problem. But I don't want to deviate from <laughs> no this. No preaching. Now you have golf. I'll, I'll do that. So, I'll do that. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so now you have golf where it actually, you know, yes, there is deforestation. Yes, there is. But there's also a lot of beautiful things that a golf course does. Uh, in the Now let's, let's, let's remind ourselves what is sustainability. Sustainability is economic is it is it supporting the economy the social aspect and the natural aspect uh, or or ecological aspect nothing that we do fred as human beings is going to be completely sustainable even even sustainable projects are not sustain or i mean they're not you know they, we we're going to alter something we're going to alter something so what are we going to do we just need to think about the best way to alter the less amount of of, of altering <laughs> that, that is that is what we need to do so so a golf course you know why did we create the butterfly golf uh concept it's because you know resorts that have 36 holes they won't need them anymore right you can do 24 and have more variety than a 36 hole golf course. So depending on, we designed this when we were doing Desertica in, uh, in Mexico, which is a very nature friendly and sensitive area. So why, why would I, why, on top of everything that we were designing, we wanted to disencourage more golf resorts to come in and, 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 and be the next, you know, Cancun or the next whatever. We want to disencourage that. So what do we do? We created the four loops of six so that we can have 24 golf courses in one. Why would anybody else come here and put another golf course as your neighbor? So those are the things that we thought about when we were designing this. It's, it's very tricky, Fred, because every single place is, is different. Every single situation is different. Every single social aspect is different. Economic is different. Uh, so what country are you doing it in, in that state, in that country, what state are you doing it? Everything changes. You just have to be conscious of what you are creating and doing and ask yourself, is this leaving some sort of legacy, some sort of lesson to, so from here, people can grow uh, uh, in, in, a, in a more sustainable way. That is, that is at least my version of it. And, you know, Fred, everything here is only how I think. It's your, it's so, your house. Uh, it's your so house. That's, that's well, all. I have to be conscious of exactly. taking another break because we want to let everyone know what happened in Golf Smarter Mulligans this coming week. So we'll be right back. This week is number four of nine in our Tony Manzoni series to help you launch your new golf season. This week is the second part of taking your game to the next level one club at a time. You know, when you're in and around the green, which is the scoring area, whether you're pitching the ball on, you want to do it the simplest way, the way that even if you miss hit it, it doesn't become a catastrophe. When you start lifting that club up and bringing it down on the ball in a more steeper angle, the miss hit is going to be horrendous, or you line drive it over the green into a lake or something like that, where when you're using a more level to the ground stroke, if you hit a little bit thin or a little bit fat, it doesn't hurt you. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 203, which is number four of nine, featuring our friend and mentor, Tony Manzoni. Check the show notes to learn how to get Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, and gain access to his video of the same name. Please subscribe for free to our sister podcast that revisits the best of the Golf Smarter podcast, and it's called Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released every Friday from wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. 
Augie, I wrote so many different questions about what I wanted to discuss with you today, and we haven't touched on any of it because everything is just flowing. Um, so what you've mentioned multiple times, the video. I've seen the video. I don't know if anybody else has seen the video or what you're talking about. Um, can I make the video available, or is this something that's uh, – what, what's the deal? And tell me about the video. No, of course. It was just – we. it's with Eric Anders, Eric Anders Land, uh, a, a dear friend of mine. I mean, we've done so many things together that we have uh, become uh, He's an online – Eric is, and, is, a, is an online – he's a YouTuber uh, – but uh, he yeah, is yeah, a yeah. content maker. Yes, a great storyteller, yeah. a fantastic storyteller, and uh, so so he creates content and 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 we we created a segment which um, uh, I, I think it was never before seen where we, we break down five golf holes, five of my favorite golf holes. So we're just breaking them down. You know what I think about this. You know about about. You know, Cypress Point's uh, 15, about uh, the 17 at TPC Sawgrass, uh, one of our designs in Tampico. So we break down five. It's on Eric Anders' feed. I, I, I mean, we've gotten some great, great reviews, some great feedback, and we were just having fun doing it. And that's, that's the whole point, isn't it, Fred? I really love this, this era of podcasting and creating content because it's – it's not, you know, you're free to talk. It's not elaborative. It's just a couple of guys having fun, that, you know, talking about what they think or their experience in life. And hopefully on this one and on the way, we can, we can wake up an aspiring golf architect out there uh, an aspiring superintendent, anybody that wants to come into this beautiful um, and and mm. unique golf. Okay. Industry. Well, I will definitely so. then put the uh, I'll put the video on the blog post for uh, at golfsmarter dot um, okay. for uh, for this episode. So everyone should check that out. It's really entertaining. It's it's really interesting. You, you talk about your five favorite golf holes in the world, right? Um. Yeah. And I had one I wanted to ask you about specifically as it's a Mexico golf course um, and the only TPC yes. course in Mexico, TPC Donzante Bay in just south of Loreto. Are you familiar with that course? I uh, have played yes, there yes, six yeah. times now because we're timeshare owners. We went to that place once and went, all right, we're in. We absolutely love uh, Donzante Good. Bay and the, uh, the Vio del Palmar islands of Loreto. It's gorgeous. Um, it's a great golf course. There's great hiking there. The, the water sea of Cortez, um, which I now understand is called the sea of Mexico because we don't think Cortez was a nice guy. So the sea of Mexico, which Jacques Cousteau <laughs> called the <laughs> aquarium of the world. It is the aquarium the best, of the world. And I've snorkeled in many places around the world. It's the best snorkeling I've ever done in my life. So number 17, TPC yeah. Donzante Bay, takes my breath away every single time I come up over the top. And then there you have it, this incredible hole, par three. Do you want to please, I would love your feedback and your thoughts on that hole. Well, I'll tell you something, Fred. Uh, it is designed by a dear friend of mine as well, Reese Jones. And uh, I've known Reese for a few years. I've, I've, I've played. I had the privilege of playing with him, nat National Golf Lakes. So, uh, so I'm biased. But regardless of the bias, it is a phenomenal design. And, and it, it's something that we also have to, you know, well, we don't have to, but let's, let's mention it. It's, it's, a, it's a different you know, this era, uh, they're pioneers in the era of, you know, student of the game architects. You know, uh, Reese Jones, uh, Robert Trent Jones, you know, uh, these. Uh, and, and now there's a great generation of golf, ar golf architects out there that are just killing it. In the past uh, seven, eight, ten years maybe, there's a new generation that uh, that is just you know creating these masterpieces, and I have to say, Don Santa Bay is one of them. 
And that par three behind there that's sitting right on that flat top overlooking the Sea of Cortes. Uh, it's actually uh, the other, the official name is the Gulf of, okay. the Gulf of Baja California. Not the Gulf, so, the Gulf. Uh, sea of Cortes is also <laughs> there. The Gulf, the Gulf of Baja. So you have the Gulf of Baja, Sea of Cortes, the aquarium of the world. Call it whatever. Just show just up. Just call it. You know, it's, we have a saying in architecture. Exactly. We have a saying in architecture. Talk bad or talk good, but talk. If you're not talking about about our architecture, that means that we're just a plain, mm-hmm. regular mm-hmm. guy, and we don't want that. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, it's a great piece, great work of art out there in Loreto. It's a little bit difficult to get to unless right. you're from LA. So you, there's mm-hmm. direct flights from LA. But other than that, coming up from Mexico, it's very difficult to get up to to Loreto, but it's a beautiful place. And if you go up to Santa Maria by car, come down, come down to, to La Paz, all of that inside of the Baja is is a beautiful, beautiful piece and un, an unspoiled yeah, yeah. piece of well, land. The thing- so you Thank did you. well on that Yeah, the Marriott thing was boring us like crazy. But um, the beautiful part about Baja, <laughs> and a lot of people probably don't know this, especially if they're not in California, Baja, California is practically the same length, miles north to south, as California's. It's big. Yeah, 1, it's big. 1,000 miles, exactly. The one of my favorite fun facts about Baja is when you get to Cabo San Lucas, which is the southernmost point of Baja, if you leave Baja and just head due south on planet Earth, the first piece of land you come to is Antarctica. There's no... I can believe right, that. You're yeah, going straight you're down. The There's Ocean. nothing. Yeah. yeah, you're going to the right. belly, through the belly of the Pacific Ocean, which... If you take the if you take planet Earth and flip it like and you look at the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you right. barely see it's land amazing. on the sides. It's pretty exciting. Go to Google Earth and just just go like this to the Earth to the Pacific Ocean. That's a very good one. I I never yeah. thought about that. And one, so uh, you're sense. right. Loretto is tough to get to. Uh, it, there are flights from Houston and from Los Angeles, right? But LA. Well, there and maybe is. San Francisco, San Francisco is during their high season. So only between, I think it's April to okay. November. No, no, other way around. November to April. Till April, no, you can get a direct April. flight from San November Francisco. It's April. only two and a half hours. It's much closer to yeah. Hawaii. And much <laughs> Hawaii. Yeah, well, eh, Loreto and, and, and kudos to Reese Jones. He a did great a job. It's not, job. you know, and here's an example, like number hole number one there, very wide fairway, very forgiving. And it's a resort course. So you're going to want to play it and go, oh, yeah, I yeah. want to come back and play it again. And generally, you'll do that, uh, you know, while you're still there. If you spend a week there, get to play a couple times because you're going to spend up a lot of time in the water, too. Um, yeah, oh, I'm glad that I'm glad that you appreciate. It. I'm glad you've played it. I I can't wait to get back to that course. I yes. just just love it. All right, let's wrap it up Super. with this one. Who are your idols in the design world of golf course architecture? Oh, uh, not uh, golden age of architecture. Alistair McKenzie, number one. A lot of inspiration from from Alistair, from his books, Spirit of St. Andrews, just unbelievable. I would have to say uh, Tom Fazio. Tom Fazio is another, uh, I can I consider him one of my mentors. I had the privilege of working at Cadencia with them. Uh, me as a junior project manager, but I had the chance to do everything down his first golf course south of the border in Cadencia, in Cabo. So I had the privilege and the honor to work with that fantastic group and including uh, Mr. Fazio. So I've always, you know, I, I get I get pumped up when I when I talk about uh, his his architecture. I think the 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 aesthetics, the quality that I learned from that golf course, which I think that I I I, I, I grabbed and and made it mine 
and, uh, and, and that's the quality that I'm looking for whenever we, we were out there working. So, um, uh, that, that is, that is that. And, uh, and right now, uh, I mean, I'm, I really admire everything that, you know, the new generation that I mentioned is, is, is out there doing. I mean, the David McClay kid, who's another oh, we've had uh, on the show. A good friend of mine. I admire his work a yep. lot. David kid is awesome. You know, um, you know, uh, you know, Corn Crenshaw, they're killing it out there. I really like what they're doing. And, uh, and you have, you know, have the, 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 the Phillips and the Dokes and all this, this great group that's coming out and just saying, hey, there is the new golden age of architecture. A hundred years later, there is this great generation, which I would love to be and feel, I, I like to feel a part of, uh, where we're just, you know, disrupting a little bit. Uh, uh, so, you know, some or, or th- you know, hold on to the golden age of architecture. I'm not like that. I, I think that maybe we haven't discovered the, the, the best way to golf architect. So I'm trying to do that. Uh, but, uh, but at the end, uh, it, is, it is a very great generation that, has, that, that is out there doing some fantastic sustainable you project. think we'll see families do this like we've seen in the past the fazios and the and the jones you know who multiple generations of designers are we going to see that ever again <laughs> hope so well i'm hoping for my kids to come in <laughs> i didn't want to lead and, you into that but okay be part of it and <laughs> go for it no of course i mean there's nothing i would be honored if uh they're still young they're still very young but i would be honored if 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 there's a family uh, legacy left behind, but, uh, you know, the, the, of course I would love, I would love that. And I would love that to continue. Yes. I mean, you know, uh, there, there's a big difference between marketing on a golf course and architecture. And, and, and now I think, you know, clients and, and, and developers have noticed that it's, it's a, it's a difference. It's, you can have the celebrity designers, you know, you know, market. Let, 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 that's yeah, a marketing let's put their name on it. Sometimes, yeah. depending on the brief, let, yeah, depending on the brief, depending on the purpose, depending on what on is the, the why, on the, on the uh, you know, the business plan, it is, and uh, what is the why? Perfect fit. And then the other why, you have now this great option of other, you know, students of the game and, and the architect. Uh, which is which is just a different way of doing it. Not, it doesn't matter who's best, who's better. Who, it depends. If it's a great fit, it's perfect for that. What we're looking for. So that that's that's all there is. That the, the the beautiful thing is that there's just a lot of options. Now. Augie, this has been so much fun. I really, I really am going to bring you, you back. I, I cannot wait to have another conversation. You're a <laughs> pizza pizza golf, right? I appreciate it. Pisa Golf, P I Z A Z A Golf.com. Check out his stuff. Um, follow mm-hmm. him on Instagram. Uh, and uh, come, yeah, at, 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 no, at, at, at Pisa Golf. Everything Pisa at Golf. P- All right. Instagram and at Pisa um, Golf. Yeah. please come to golfsmarter.com and uh, you'll check out the video um, on the blog post. You'll check out the video that he did. Uh, but boy, was this entertaining. Augie, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Can't wait to have another one. Fred, thank you very much. I really appreciate your interest in our work because it's not just Augie Pisa. I have a beautiful, beautiful team behind me. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I'm just very grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit of, of my thoughts and the way I think. So thank you very much, Fred. For those of you who've been writing to me over the last 10 days, thank you for your patience as today is my first day back and uh, from vacation and was met with computer problems that took all of my morning and lunch, which delayed production of this episode. I will be responding to your emails in the next 24 hours. So we just returned from our outrageous adventure that was Kind of like being on safari, but this time we were on the west coast of Baja, California, in the water, interacting with mother and baby gray whales. 
the key word here is interacting, as this is the only place in the world where mother whales encourage their newborn calves to go up to these 24-foot boats with no more than seven people aboard and literally encourage the calves to get petted and kissed and sung to by humans. I I can't think of, other than your dogs and, you know, domesticated animals, I can't think of any wild animals that encourage their babies to interact with humans. It's outrageous. And it was so much fun and so exciting. I love that stuff. Uh, I'm working on a video that will get posted, but uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, check out Baja, B-A-J-A, BajaEcoTours.com. As I'm recording this, it's still raining here in Northern California, but it's supposed to calm down starting tomorrow, thank goodness, because I'm really having some serious golf withdrawals. Having only played a couple times uh, since November, I I know you folks in the Midwest and the East, I know you go months without playing every year, but I don't. So this is really hard for me. I want to thank Tom Thompson of Delphi, Indiana for opening up today's episode. As a Golf Smarter ambassador, Tom chose to receive Tony Manzoni's video of the Lost Fundamental, and you can too. Send an email to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com and request our simple instructions to leave a voicemail at our toll-free Golf Smarter line. And when you do, you can choose one of three gifts, including a dozen balls with a Golf Smarter logo from Odin Golf, the golf brand that sponsors and pays everyday golfers. These tour quality balls are a fraction of the price of what you'll usually pay. And when you use the code GOLFSMARTER at checkout, you'll receive an additional 20% off the order. Their link is in today's show notes. You also have the option to receive a new glove and glove storage compartment from redroostergolf.com. And of course, you can also get that private online link to Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental. So please send an email and I'll get back to you with some instructions of what to do and what to say. Just write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.